So Alex, thank you for being here with us at the uh, GoLab. I have a few questions and we are particularly interested in uh, the outcome-based approach to tackle social isolation and loneliness. Can you tell us uh, something about what are the current practices and what is most innovative about tackling isolation? So I think people are increasingly aware that isolation and loneliness are a real problem. They're particularly known to be a problem for older people, but actually for all sorts of groups of people. Um, at the moment, I think we're less clear on how um, we can tackle isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. So. It tends to be work that's done uh, on quite a small scale. Uh, we're not yet seeing uh, really um, stable and large scale investment in tackling isolation and loneliness, despite the fact that we know that it's a problem for very large numbers of people um, and that it has really significant um, health impacts, not just um, causing people uh, misery. Um, so I think we've got a long way to go uh, to, and, and I think actually there's an opportunity for, for all of our public services to um, think about the extent to which the people they're supporting, particularly people, older people and others who need long-term support, um, to, th to think about the, the impact that all of our services are having on um, how connected people are, how isolated um, or how included they feel in their community. Um, and I think that's something we should be embedding as core business, not just seeing as a, mm. an option on extra. Yeah. And talking about innovation, can you tell us more about shared lives and especially what are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? So there are 150 shared life schemes around the country um, and all of them uh, recruit people who can come from any walk of life um, to become shared life carers. So. Um, uh, if you wanted to become a shared life carer, your local scheme would put you through an approval process which lasts three to six months because you're going to work really independently. And then they'd match you with an adult who needs support. Mm. Uh, and once you'd found a good match, you'd share family and community life. So that would mean somebody either moving in with you and living as part of your household uh, or somebody visiting you regularly for short breaks or day support. So it's an unusual model um, in adult services in which... People uh, are getting personal care, they're getting the, the support they need as part of a regulated service, but they're getting that in an ordinary family home from somebody um, they've chosen to be with. Uh, and I meet people who've lived together for uh, years and years and they just really regard each other as part of the family. So I think one of the things that makes it unique is that it's combining what are often two very separate worlds. You've got the world of what services do, um, and what families and communities do. And in Shared Lives, you bring both of those things together. Uh, and that um, can tackle some, some problems and create, create outcomes that other kinds of service really struggle mm -hmm. to achieve, so particularly things around loneliness. So we found that nearly everybody who uses Shared Lives say that they make new friends. Um, and actually, um, a third of people said they made five or more new friend, friends through shared lives. Those aren't really the sorts of things that, that most um, social care services even measure, um, let alone really hope to achieve. Um, and uh, that's what I think makes it feel very different to the people who are involved. People just say, look, we just feel like part of the family. Who would benefit the most from engaging with shared lives? What type of... So, so at the moment, people? the majority of people using shared lives are adults with learning disabilities, um, uh, followed by people with mental health problems. Um, there's a growing number of older people, including people with dementia, for instance, who rather than wanting to visit a day centre are visiting a shared life carer. Uh, but it's also being used with a really wide range of people, so people who are trying to return home from hospital, um, care leavers, uh, young people who are leaving um, uh, state care um, as they approach adulthood uh, and um, we have a new partnership uh, with an organisation called Safe Lives around uh, supporting women fleeing domestic violence. So uh, anybody really who needs support, um, a bed and friends. So and if I want to embed shared lives in my community, what are the key success factors? What makes it work? So most areas have a shared life scheme, but some of, some of them are tiny. So, so some of them support hundreds of people and, and some of them support um, you know, a dozen people. So there's a really wide variation. In the successful areas, um, it's not just about the quality of that organisation, uh, and we do lots at Shared Lives Plus to support those organisations uh, and the shared life, the individual shared life carers to um, 
uh, to provide shared lives really effectively and safely. So it's, it's, not, it's a partly about the provision, but it's not just about that. It's also about whether the rest of the system recognises and values what shared lives can achieve. So um, you, you have some areas where they've got a good shared lives scheme, but actually people, it's not getting referrals. Mm -hmm. um, so some uh, s professionals can be a bit wary of it because it's not like a normal service. It doesn't look like something they're familiar with. Um, and for others, they're just not really aware that it's there, even though they could be making much greater use of it.